this week's drive, we slide into unfamiliar territory. Hold on too long for a wild ride into the scenery. Get much too close to the action. And have fun for a living in Siberia. All this and more in this week's Drive. The best seat in the Formula One house. It may be a bit awkward to get into and a bit cramped, but once you have, you'll be surprisingly comfortable. You'd have to be. It's from here that drivers must fight not only each other, but also the centrifugal and lateral forces generated by the cars accelerating, braking and cornering. The odd-looking seat that the teams make for each of their drivers is literally a custom-made one-off. The way that you do a seat is you, you are using two-pipe foam or foam balls and making them go off. You have a mock-up in the factory. The driver sits in there inside a bag and, the sh and the, this foam, when it sets and goes off, forms to his shape. So he gets into the car and gets comfortable where he wants to be. And the main parameters he's trying to be is make sure he's as low as possible, his feet are on the pedals, and his, his arms are clearing everything, so he will have a steering wheel and make sure that he's not going to hit his elbows on the seat. Then the seat is scanned into a computer. Uh, and then a uh, tooling is made, and then you can make a part off this tooling. A tailor-made seat for maximum comfort, made like most of the rest of the car from ultra-lightweight carbon fibre. The thin layers are meticulously cut, shaped, and then baked in a huge oven-like autoclave. The finished item is very light but immensely strong, shaped to form a shell which should fit like a glove, but sometimes things don't quite work out. They normally don't get it right the first time, to be honest. It's because you sit there and you say, oh, yeah, this is good. Then you get here, you drive the car, and, oh, everything hurts, everything comfortable, you know, you gotta change everything again. The seat needs to be both comfortable and very strong. In his serious high-speed crash at Indianapolis, Williams driver Ralph Schumacher benefited from the safety features built into his seat. He was gently removed from the wrecked car, still strapped into it, as his testing team manager explains. The seats have a couple of, of features on them. They're, they're very lightweight, but still very strong and safe. The straps that are on the seat are so that if the driver has an accident, and you need to get him out of the car, you can actually remove the driver while he's still fastened into the seat in one lump. Yeah. Um, so yes, it is a bit like a child seat from a road car. The similarities between Formula One and kiddie seats are greater than you'd expect, although Junior gets a lot more comfort. This child seat is like a Formula One seat in many ways. The child is secured with a five-point safety belt, while these lateral elements provide good side impact protection. Child restraint systems in passenger cars are extremely important because the majority of children involved in accidents are not pedestrians or cyclists, but passengers in cars. Child seats have to prove just how safe they are in a variety of extreme crash tests. As a result, car manufacturers are designing and building child seat anchor points into new models. A seat can therefore only be as safe as you make it, and making sure that the occupant is safely and firmly strapped in. Safety in Formula One has made huge advances thanks mostly to the widespread use of carbon fibre, as well as the adoption of crumple zones, impact absorbing zones, rollover bars and higher cockpit sides, as well as the new head and neck support system. But at the seat of all the safety measures is the need to keep the driver immobilised in one place while the collision occurs, and that's where that made-to-measure carbon shell does the job. Sebastian Bourdais claimed pole position and became the first driver to break the one-minute barrier during qualifying. And he made a decent start in Sunday's race before things got crazy into the very first turn. Bourdais fell from the pole to 13th position when he and his teammate Bruno Jonquera collided, when Jonquera, starting outside Bourdais, got a better run into the first corner. 
he cut inside Bourdais as both drivers started braking. Then the two cars bumped coming out of the turn. Bourdais spun with three other cars as Junquera grabbed the lead. A crash at Road America had already put a strain on the relationship between the teammates. But just as he has all season, Bourdais proved to have the car that no one could match. He passed four cars to move into ninth place within 10 laps and kept working his way through the 1.65 mile course and passed Paul Tracy with 10 laps left, going on to win for the fifth time this year. Bourdais took the checkered flag 7.4 seconds ahead of Tracy, celebrating the victory with a few donuts in front of the fans and a series of fist pumps as he headed to the pits. Jinquira was third. The Frenchman finished the 90-lap race in one hour and 40 minutes, increasing his champ car points lead to 56 over Junquira and 68 over Tracy. It was a dry day for racing as the sun came out at the famous 11-corner Western New York track. Despite an upset stomach, Tony Stewart started fourth after qualifying was cancelled because of a wet track and the field was set by team points. His team had road course ace Boris Sad standing by in case Stewart couldn't race. After only six laps of the open spaces of a road course, Brian Vickers thumped a curb and took out Dale Jarrett. On banked ovals, there are unforgiving concrete walls, but here it's the equally terminal sand traps. That could be. Later on, lap 16, Greg Biffle ran into the rear end of Sterling Marlin's car as Marlin spun and hit the tyre barrier. Biffle continued, but Marlin's day was over. Then on lap 31, with no one around him, Hermie Sadler locked up his front wheels and went off the track into the gravel trap. Later, he would be black flagged for driving too slowly. On the next restart, Scott Wimmer spun off at turn one, managed to avoid contact with any other cars, kept his motor running and was able to continue. Not so lucky was Brendan Gorn, who also spun out with 18 laps to go. He went a couple of feet into the sand trap, off the first turn and was stuck. Look at the rocks coming out already from the other off the course. Other rock excursion. Should have been. Stop short, stop short, stop short. Oh, no. <laughs> Just about six feet. Yep. That's too bad. Overcoming the physical cramps that Despite his illness, Stewart won the race with an average speed of 92 miles an hour in a race slowed five times by 11 laps of caution. There were 13 lead changes among nine drivers, and last year's winner, Robbie Gordon, finished 16th. The 2002 series and Watkins Glen champion also got his second win of the season and the 19th of his career. Carmaker Nissan on the comeback trail have accepted that they will need to become a truly international company to survive so they've been holding the world launches of some models in the markets where they'll be sold. The new Quest minivan gets a complete redesign and goes up market with features like a DVD player, four glass roof windows in sky view, a navigation system, stability control and a rear parking monitor. A new truck marks Nissan's entry into the American full-size pickup market in four-door extended cab and four-door crew cab versions. The only engine is a 305 horsepower 5.6 liter twin cam V8 mated to a five-speed automatic transmission with either two or four-wheel drive that must be disengaged on dry roads. An anti-skid system is optional as are front side airbags and head protecting curtain side airbags for both seating rows. Firsts for a pickup include a locking storage compartment in the left rear mudguard, a factory sprayed in bed liner, adjustable cargo tie downs and a fold flat front passenger seat. Titan shares its chassis and powertrain with Nissan's Armada SUV. Concept cars like the Murano direct future ideas. It's a chunky, working 4x4 with a 3.5-litre V6 engine and continuously variable transmission, a sophisticated gearbox that delivers constant acceleration and decent fuel economy. The Murano is based on the Ultima unibody platform, which will spawn more mid-sized vehicles with cavernous interiors and sophisticated multi-link rear suspension. Its wheelbase is four inches longer than the big Toyota Highlander 4x4. So, what's your dream job? If you think you'd be good at designing things like cars, listen to car guru Bob Lutz.
Back in the old days, you could buy a less attractive car because of its reliability reputation. Nobody has to do that anymore. The quality of all cars is the same now. You'd need a fleet of a thousand cars to pick up statistical differences. So the last big differentiator is design. It's becoming critical. Around the world, automotive design has finally made a comeback. In the 1950s and 60s, cars had style and charisma. But by the time the 70s rolled around, environmental and safety issues forced manufacturers to shift their focus away from appearance and function. But nowadays, consumers are demanding function and form. And today, General Motors alone employs over 600 designers around the world. Weldon makes a special effort to recruit the world's best and brightest, like these savvy young designers at the Art Center College of Design in California. When you're designing for different people, you need to understand the culture and the market that you're designing for. If you're not part of that background, if you're not from there, you won't know who you're making a product for, and ultimately it can fail. It's a lot like product design, except it's huge on this huge scale. Just imagining you see a car going down the street that you know you had something to say about. Lead designer Franz von Holzhausen, whose work includes the new Pontiac Solstice Roadster and the Chevy SS concept car, describes what it takes to make it in the automotive design world. It's about having gas in your blood and just being passionate about design and passionate about coming up with new innovative ideas. And you know, I think there's somehow there's an innate designer in everybody. It's just whether you unleash it or not. After the World Cup, the Speedway Grand Prix season resumed in Gothenburg, where riders set out in pursuit of championship leader Jason Crump in the sixth round. In Heat 8, fellow Australian Ryan Sullivan came to grief and was disqualified after a fall, coming into the home straight. He walked away but scored no points from the heat. Heat 9 was where Crump showed his class. The favourite to clinch the title got to the front and held the advantage in his usual smooth, crowd-pleasing style. The local fans also had plenty to cheer about, with hometown hero Tony Ricardson bringing them to their feet in Heat 20 with a hard-fought photo finish that reflected the nature of the Fast and Furious competition. By the end of the night, it was down to a battle between the two men. As always, the Australian champion had plenty of support, but his challenge came from Danish rider Hans Andersen, who would wrap up victory in the final heat. Coming into the fourth and final lap, Anderson held the lead, but had to hold his nerve too with Crump breathing down his neck. Showing great poise, Anderson held his form to cross the line first in the heat and first on the night. Going into the latest round, the popular winner was in 19th place on the riders' table, but left the Ullevi Stadium with both his prospects and his confidence boosted. While Anderson enjoyed his victory, it was Crump who benefited most from the round, with his main title rival and countryman Lee Adams falling further back in the race for the season's honours. Anderson may well be out of title calculations, but nothing was going to stop him and his very happy teammates from celebrating a Scandinavian Grand Prix victory. Round seven of the Grand Prix series will be held in Slovenia in two weeks. It's fitting that the leaders are from the country that invented the sport, but the championship is still wide open. Even five times champ Ricardson can still take it. There were long faces in the Aprilia pit in practice for the Czech Moto Grand Prix when British rider Shaky Byrne crashed, suffering a dislocated wrist and concussion. Byrne high-sided his Aprilia halfway through the morning session, splattering the track surface with oil as his RS3 bounced across the tarmac. In the time session, Sete Gibbonau grabbed his fourth pole position of the year as autumn arrived early in the Czech Republic. The MotoGP riders had only one dry session to set up their bikes for the race after the second free practice session was dogged by heavy rain in the afternoon. Alex Barros splashed boldly through the puddles with a late charge, which moved him up to second place alongside Gibbonau, with the Honda pair joined on the front row by reigning world champion Valentino Rossi on his Yamaha. 
Rossi recovered from a problematic wet session on Friday, lapping 0.6 of a second off the pole position time and dislodging Ducati rider Troy Bayliss from the front row. However, fourth place represented an equal best grid position this season for Bayliss, hoping for a repeat of his podium here a year ago. The Australian was joined on the second row by his arch rival from his world superbike days, Honda's Colin Edwards, and Yamaha rider Carlos Checa, who was unable to approve on his provisional pole time and dropped to sixth place. Spaniard Checa crashed out of a potential pole position lap with 11 minutes of the session left. Rain prevented most of the 250 riders from improving on their Friday times, Sebastian Porto claiming pole for the sixth time this season. Dani Pedrosa and Randy Depunier, leading the championship, were well off the pace. Marco Simoncelli improved his provisional time in the final 125 qualifying session, holding off Andrea De Vizioso in a late gamble for times as a dry line began to form. The next day, the MotoGP race got underway on a dry track. Gibanao led from Barros, Biagi, Edwards and Rossi. Valentino quickly dispensed with Edwards and challenged Biagi for third place. Biagi passed Barros for second on lap three, and Rossi relegated Barros to fourth a lap later, as Gibanao took an advantage of this battle to stretch his lead to nearly a second. Rossi put a great over and under move on Biagi to claim second, and then put in some fast laps to close right up on Gibanao, while Barros was looking for a way past Biagi. But a lap later, Barros lost control of his front wheel and slid into the gravel and out of the race. Up front, Gibanao was looking to be in control as Valentino Rossi made some increasingly desperate moves to pass. They slowed each other up in the process, which allowed Biagi to close right up on them. Biagi passed Rossi with four laps left, but ran wide, letting Rossi back through to open up a gap. Nicky Hayden crashed out of fourth place, four laps after his teammate Barros, putting an end to the Americans' best ride of the year. Gibanao pulled out over a second on Rossi on the penultimate lap, so Rossi opted for a safe second place, and Sete crossed the line with a three-second lead. Biagi came home third. Gibanao's third win of the season closes the gap slightly in the championship. The Spaniard has 167 points to Rossi's 184, but that fourth consecutive title has moved a step closer. Sebastian Porto won a controversial 250cc event after several calls to stop the race due to rain. Dani Pedrosa grabbed the lead between showers, but could only watch as Porto and Depunier both went past, sealing a 1-2 for Aprilia and their 100th victory in the class. Third place for Pedrosa cuts his championship lead to 30 points from Depunier, with Porto a further 13 points back. In the 125cc class, Lucas Pesek was one of several riders to crash out. Title contender Casey Stoner was another. Jorge Lorenzo took another breathtaking victory with a last lap charge. Andrea De Vizioso had looked set to win, but was hauled in and had to fight to clinch second place. Roberto Locatelli fought up from 30th to take third, and Hector Barbera could only manage seventh, strengthening De Vizioso's title lead. The young Italian leads Locatelli by 36 points. Scottish actor Ewan McGregor recently roared into New York's Battery Park on his dusty BMW 1150cc motorcycle, ending a 20,000-mile jaunt from London that he took with fellow actor and best friend Charlie Borman, who rode an identical bike. The big and rugged machines have been the preferred choice of seasoned long-distance globetrotters for over 20 years. The 33-year-old McGregor, made famous by his appearances in the Star Wars films, and Borman took a little over three months to complete a road adventure through Eastern Europe and some hostile terrain in Mongolia, Siberia and Alaska. It was a, it was a good excuse to ride motorcycles for a very, very long length of time. <laughs> and that was it. That was, that was bottom line, that was it. Yeah. Charlie and I, our, our relationship friendship's been based around about motorcycles um, for about nine, ten years now. And, um, it was just, it, we'd done everything else, it was, an, well, no, we haven't actually, no, we've got no, lots we've got more, to, lots do, more but to do, but it was a good excuse to ride bikes for a very long time. McGregor and Borman, who underwent survival training with ex-soldiers before embarking on the trip, filmed much of the journey themselves using handheld and bike-mounted cameras. The cameraman joined them at certain points along the way. Right now, it's really overwhelming to just just have rolled into New York and to you know to, to have to have had a dream to ride around the world and to have dedicated ourselves for eight months now to to do it and to be standing here having done it. It's just quite an enormous feeling and it's quite overwhelming really. So it's difficult to 
explain how you feel. I mean, there's so many wonderful memories from it, and, and they'll, they'll keep flooding back for the rest of our lives, I think. The leg through Mongolia was probably the most difficult. So what's next for the actor? I have no idea. I don't have any plans at the moment. I just want to ride my bike a bit more, which is <laughs> crazy after, after almost 20,000 miles. You shouldn't really want to get back on it, but I just want to keep going. It's an addiction. Now, it's it is. Yeah, it's yeah. a drug. It's a good drug. Yeah. Their personal diaries and the pictures they took along the way will be published as a travel memoir entitled Long Way Round in November. It's a dream trip for many motorcyclists, and anyone looking for a ride buddy can call me anytime. So there is a road route. The crack of dawn peels into daylight to reveal four-wheel drive freaks crashing into dry riverbeds, bushland and gorges in an effort to raise funds for Kenya's conservation. Give them a car, a map and a large expanse of unspoiled Africa and let them loose. It's a crazy challenge only for those who are brave enough to face the African wilderness at its most rugged and who like to have a huge amount of fun. Cliffs, swamps, dense thorn and large, fierce territorial mammals are the obstacles, and many entrants fall by the wayside. Those who make it through are rarely unscathed, yet all keep coming back for more, year after year, in the name of the Rhino Ark. Begun eight years ago, Ken Kule, chairman of Rhino Ark, said the idea for an off-road car endurance event came from a small group of safari rally enthusiasts whose notion of a family outing was to drive across the country exploring wild and remote areas. The Rhino Charge has grown to a colossal size during the eight years in which it has existed, and with each entrant, organizational facility and checkpoint being sponsored, it's become a major feature on Kenya's fundraising as well as sporting and entertainment calendar. The event attracts adventurers from all over the world. Young and old join together with 18 to 80-year-olds competing and hundreds of families and friends supporting from the roadside and the bar. Teams take part in all kinds of vehicles and well-known rallying enthusiasts from Kenya are joined by teams from South Africa and the UK, including a squad from the British Army. This cause to, to go out and build a fence up, in our, up there is where to, where to look after our ecosystem. Kenya needs an ecosystem, we, need, um, we have to have rain. The race is currently the largest fundraiser for a fence being built around Kenya's Aberdeer's rainforest, home to the endangered black rhinos. The fence doesn't just keep poachers out, it also helps to protect people living in the area. Preserving the Aberdeer ecosystem is all the more important because five of Kenya's largest rivers begin there. This year, 65 teams of fanatical drivers headed into the bush to drive the shortest distance between 13 checkpoints. The annual event has a different course every year, and participants are never aware of their route until the night before. This year's race raised around 400,000 US dollars, an amount that will go a long way in helping the cause. It's also not cheap to take part in the race. Every car must raise at least 1,300 US dollars for this competitive event. The winner of this year's race, Rob Collinge, driving his Range Rover, may have had a lot of car trouble, but he managed a win by driving the shortest distance of just 6.377 kilometers. Fun, adrenaline and bush bashing aside, these machines and animal lovers did indeed raise a good amount towards their country's conservation. So whether you're always sliding sideways, have designs on a new future, or you're just getting comfortable behind the wheel, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.